takes me back. I'm just like 13, 14 at the Everett Church of the Brethren. Um, the new creation we're singing and the brother that was singing that song was in a tremendous fiery accident. His face was brutally scarred. So it was over half of his body. He was just so blessed in his heart and his voice was so powerful. Of God's mercy in his life. I'll never forget him singing that song. Never forget him. He sang it with tears rolling down his cheeks. He said, if God had not delivered me from the fire on this earth, he said, I would be in hellfire tonight. So take from that and know, no matter what, God will always say what? I feel First Samuel chapter one. Um, we find here that there's a tremendous passage. Um, and this is sanctity of human life, Sunday. We really addressed that a couple of weeks ago. Okay. My, my whole point is to come off of that now. Sanctity of human life, soul. S-O-H-L. And here is Hannah. She's childless. And she's pouring out her soul. S-O-U-L. And the Lord knows we need some deep soul crying and praying in the church of Jesus Christ today. It in your life as well as in my life when we get desperate enough for God not just for his blessing not just for what he may grant us for God himself in his will in my life in soul praying, when we pour out our soul as Hannah did, we start out pouring out to God our desire and our need, our hope, our want. And we end up with, Thy will be done, just as our Master. The question I put out to you this morning is, when was the last time, if ever, you were engaged in soul praying before the Lord, as we'll find out here this morning? And are we truly praying as we ought to be for the unborn in America? For the little babies that are in the womb and under grave circumstances, their little lives are not in the womb of one who desires the child to be there. And there is a great, great, great valley of decision, a great battle. Pouring out prayer. And on a day when we hear the request by this couple, pray as we continue to see God and and for the fertility process in our life. And how many babies will be aborted just today? Human life. To always be the advocate for those who have no voice in the womb, and on the other end of life. 
no voice, no strength, always at the mercy of another. Be it in prayer before the Lord. Prayers. How the church needs prayer, but in prayer, but it doesn't, it is not going to change. We're not going to change. The church isn't going to change until there are a few at least pour out their hearts unto the Lord for revival in the church. And then when God's church is revived, then things will change in the land. Then things will happen for the glory of God. But by and large, most of the church teeter tots in this area in between where I'm okay. I am in charge of my life and I kind of like it that way, but I'm also, you know, tapping in with God and, and, you know, I want him, I'm serving him, but I don't want all my life to go there. We're just in this here, I'm in charge of my life thing. And that's the kind of life that God addresses in Revelation when he says, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm. So pray. Pouring out the heart before the Lord, just as he did himself. First Samuel chapter one. There was a certain man of Ramathium Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Alkana, son of Jerome, son of Elihu, son of Tohu son of Zuf and Ephrathite generations in there and he had two wives the name of one was Hannah the name of the other was Peninnah and Peninnah had children but Hannah had no children now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli Hophni and Peninnah were the priests of the Lord. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. To Hannah. He gave a double portion because he loved her. Though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Verse 9, And after they had eaten and drunken in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Hannah was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. I will give him back to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, but only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have pouring, have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grants your petition that you have made to him. She said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. 
Then the woman went away. She ate. Her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. The Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for you from the Lord. God bless the reading of this holy word into our hearts, prayers. My dear ones, how often our prayers are so relaxed, rehearsed, uh, many times with not much feeling. Prayers that are more about ourselves than about the Lord, prayers that are forced, prayers that seem duty. And then there are those rare moments where during prayer, when you're pouring out your heart before the Lord, He comes close. That's happened to you. He's come so close. I remember my own life when that happened for the very first time. I was still a back when the farm and I'm there in the dining room and in prayer before the Lord just poured my heart out before him and he came so close it's, it's like a, it's a beautiful thing but it's a fearful thing but I, I crawled I crawled behind the couch God I you know but when the Lord comes close which is what we long for Our dependency, our dependency upon the Lord to be totally bankrupt in need of the Lord and knowing that in Christ is my life. God wants all of each one of us, our heart, but we usually only give Him so much. We give Him a little here and a little there. Because it's easier to be in control. It's easier in our life to be need in rather than need the needed rather than needy. That's the flow of human self. Being in control. To live with this illusion that I can make it on my own. I can figure out my problems. I can do my thing. I can, I got my life to live, and phew, here I go. And we just kind of tag God along now, man. But boy, we'll let, the, let the crunch come, and then we are pulling him a little closer and wanting a little more of him. But on a daily routine basis, no. The Lord, pouring the heart out before the Lord. And you know, this, this between just living and being willing to pour out your soul before the Lord. Hannah, pouring out her soul before the Lord. When we are living in our own, in our own world, so to say, managing God on our own terms, we're not only out of sync with God, we're out of sync with this whole universe. We're out of connect with ourselves, really, to pour our hearts out before the Lord. David, in Psalm 42, he was poured out his heart before the Lord. As the deer pants for the water, so pants my soul after you. When will I come and appear before God? He would go on in his prayers, oh, that my, as Jeremiah would say, oh, that my heart is so so burdened for my people, for the people of God, that my eyes are fountains of tears as I pour out my soul before God. Pouring out the soul. We will never pour out the soul before the Lord until we are desperate for God. I didn't say desperate for what we want. 
but until we're desperate for God. The Lord Jesus Christ, there is an old hymn from the mid 1700s. And the title is, I Thirst, Thou Wounded Lamb of God. I thirst. When the matters of life are so, so contrary to what is peaceful and blessing, contrary to the desires when there's so much loss, just as we sang, He comes to me when I'm in my desert place. Wow. All these songs and even the musician, how the Lord puts all this together for us this morning, as He always does. The Lord Jesus Christ, I thirst, thou wounded Lamb of God, to wash me in thy cleansing blood, to dwell within thy wounds. Then pain is sweet and life or death is gain. Take my poor heart and let it be forever closed to all but thee. When we were pouring out our heart before the Lord, everything in life is negotiable except one thing, and that is God I want you. That is non-negotiable. Everything else in my life is negotiable. He says here, close to all but to thee. Seal thou my breast and let me wear that pledge of love forever there. We sing another song. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. And in the song it says, come to the withered of soul. This is where we're getting to this morning. To the withered of soul. To the disease of soul, if you will. There's a disease in the soul of all mankind, and it's called death. And death rules and reigns until Christ redeems, until one calls upon Jesus for salvation. And then in life, living in Christ, the heart still gets wayward, and disease sets in, or anguish sets in, or longings for even righteousness sets in to the point that the heart becomes, if I may use the term, diseased or withered of soul. It's like the pumpkin vine. In that pumpkin vine, the squash vine borer, he will feed on the nutrients of the vine close to the main stem. Did you ever notice how a long stretch of vine can be dead but it's still alive out here? Well, eventually, it's going to be dying. Death is coming, but it doesn't realize it yet. It's like cut flowers. They're dead. They're pretty. They're dead, but they don't realize it yet. And we find here that all the flow of nutrients by this vine borer is cut off, and it keeps feeding what it has to eventually it all dies. And we find then that, that there's also this striped cucumber beetle that will feed on, on cukes and on squash and on pumpkins um, when they're in the very early young growth stage. Then the next generation, while laying eggs, and then the next generation will come and it'll feed on the flowers and the posies of the vine. And all in between the little nodes, the little, little uh, lymph nodes and what have you, and the little bugs of these to continue to feed on the roots. So there is so much that happens and surrounds the very heart of the pumpkin. And looking out here, it looks like it's still alive, but it's not. The same thing happens with the human heart. The human heart. It either becomes diseased or withered because of sin in life and you can go on looking okay and hey that guy he looks like he's doing good but inside he's not he's dying
because of the sin that's in his heart and refusing to be right before the Lord. So eventually it'll show. It'll come forth. Or you have on the other end of the spectrum, you have those who long for truth and righteousness and in a desire as Hannah did for a child. And it just so consumed her heart and her soul. And it had a, it had a, a, a root of bitterness. It had the, just the, the torment of the other wife. The ridicule. And the pain that this brought. And she's here. She's pouring out her heart and her soul before the Lord. Try to get that picture. She's pouring out her soul before God. And he's not up there, well, when you get a little bit more reduced, then I'll answer you. No. No. And the same with him for you and I. You can just picture him. He's with her. He's hearing. He's weeping over her. She's pouring her soul out before the Lord. And now, as, as he says here in the text, she came, poured it out for a child. Not for then a child to keep, but for a child to give back to the God, to the Lord. Not a child to keep, but a child to give. Bless my womb. Open my womb. Give me a child that I may give him back to you. And he'll serve you. I pledge that. I vow that. And he will be a Nazarite. No razor shall ever touch his head. He will not drink strong drink. And all goes on and on and on about the vows of a Nazarite. He will serve you. He will be great all the days of his life for the Lord. And you know, as the story goes on, she was faithful to that. To come to the day. She went to the house of the Lord. And her son stayed behind in serving the Lord. Job in chapter 30, verse 16 says, Now my soul is poured out upon me. The days of affliction have taken hold upon me. And, then, and so with Job and, and Hannah, she was of withered soul. Job of withered soul. David of withered soul. Where are the hearts of withered soul? Where, where are the people of God praying for the glory of God? Jealous for God. In the hearts of His people and in our society and in our culture. We go back to the very beginning this morning in our prayers. How routine they are. How formal they can be. It happens to us all. All of us. With God, I don't want anything but you. I bring my request, I bring my heart, I bring my, my will, and it ends up your will. Thy will be. This was our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Isaiah the prophet says about the Messiah to come, he will pour out his soul unto death. God said, I will number him among the strong. I'll divide the spoil between the small and the great. Why? Because he poured out his soul unto death. Where did he pour out his soul? Where did Jesus pour out his soul unto death? At the cross? Certainly, because it was unto death. But my dear friends, it happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Absolutely in the Garden of Gethsemane. God very God, man very man. And here pouring out his soul. He, he, 
bowed before his father and he prayed. He said, God, if there's any other way that this cup can be removed from me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Hannah says, God, I, I petition you, I call upon you, grant me a child that I may give him back to you. And I want you to notice in the scripture that after she left the temple that day, her countenance was no longer sad. Was she pregnant yet? No. But she was so given over to the Lord. She knew God had heard her prayers. And she was happy. She was content. However that it would be. The Lord. Coming in here, Lord, you know, we bring our will before the Lord. When you pour out your heart and soul unto the Lord, you start with your will and you end up with, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. To be barren in her day is very, very harsh. Very harsh. In a day where babies are, are just you, destroyed from wombs right and left. And in Hannah's day, it was a cultural disgrace. Babies were destroyed when enemy armies such as the Assyrians who were just in, in just horrible horrible warriors powerful and they would be known just to rip into the wombs and grab the little babies out had us praying for a child and in our culture we've had people you know not understanding the sanctity of human life why because they don't know the Lord is why. And Christians that get caught up in this, in this valley of decision. Because their heart's not fully given to the Lord. They don't understand things. They're living their own life. How many of us in here this morning are not living our own life, my dear one? Hey, we'll stand before him and give an account of the life that he granted to us. He has blessed us amazingly, called us into salvation, and yet we go on then to live holding on to the reins of our own life. It is a blessed thing, a blessed thing when it comes, when the heart becomes withered to the point in the battle and in the fuss and in the fight. And in the longing, the yearning to be set free for whatever, it is a blessed thing for the heart to be poured out before God. Christ, in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times as he prayed, if there's another way, Father, if there is another way, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will but thine. And after that third time, he rises finds the sleeping disciples and he says come on boys let's go look up the time has come the enemy is near he was settled it was all settled it was the will of God why pouring out his soul unto death the very thought not only of all the anxiety and the anguish and the horribleness of, of the crucifixion as we read in Psalm 22 when he says my, my flesh is dried up my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth you know he, and, and, and said that the bulls of Bashan are just surrounding me not only but what he would endure physically but his greatest anguish was the forecoming in that moment when he would be separated from his father and poured out his soul so he so identifies he knows what you and I go through and he is the one who provides for all things the Lord Jesus you know there there are those by the boatloads who are willing to be successful for God in a very great and public way great way grandiose you know Everybody can see and know what I do, but how many are willing to be, according to human terms, a failure for God and die on a little small hill 
where he has placed you to serve, where he sends you. Nobody knows it, really, but the Lord. And you say, my Lord, my God, if this is where you want me, this is where I will serve, this will be the hill that I die on. For Christ died on the hill of Mount Calvary for me, pouring out the soul unto death, pouring it out unto the Lord. When we pour out our soul unto the Lord, we begin with our desire and we end up with His, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pouring out her soul. She went home. And in God's timing, she conceived. In the lesson is, we fuss, we fume, we rebel, we carry on against God until our hearts are withered to the point by His divine guidance and we see what I really need is just God. He is all I need. When everything, Lord, in my life is negotiable, but one thing, take from me everything you want. I only want you I want my life to count for you, however that may be. Therein is the true freedom of Christianity. Even when she was challenged by Eli, he says, you drunken thing, you. Get up, put your booze away, and get out of here. She confronted him very politely and firmly, no, my Lord. I am a woman in great distress and he blessed her he blessed her the Lord Jesus Christ when she poured out her soul she made a vow O Lord of hosts if you bless me with this child I will give him many times oh my do we ask the Lord for something we plead the Lord for something and he grants it and we go on to forget all maybe the promises that we made to him Hannah she wasn't praying for a son to have prayed for a son to give this deeply distressed woman in verse 10 she prayed to the Lord and she wept bitterly come to the withered of soul come I'm dying and all I need is you Lord. all I need is you David and he pours out his heart to the Lord many times many times and we read here of Hannah we read of Job we read of Samuel as well we read here of the Lord Jesus Christ how many times Paul the apostles we don't have record of poured out their soul unto the Lord and so it asks the question when is the last time you prayed pouring out your soul how many times did you know that this is where you should be and you refuse to turn around and you walk away from it because you're afraid to let go of your life? You're afraid to come to the point where you say, not my will, but thy will be done, Lord. And thereby, when that happens in your life, when you make that kind of a decision, you're walking away from the most blessed, blessed, blessed relief, release, and love in life that God has planned for you. But in the event of it all, may we all feel the burden and know the battle for truth and righteousness and pour out our soul for truth. Pour out our soul for our young folks, our little kids, our little babies, the generations to come. 
pour out our souls before the Lord. When was the last time you poured out your soul? Beginning with your desire and ending up with His will. Thy will be done. You're all I need. Elkin, I know. Aren't I more to you than ten sons? Hannah, Lord, you're all I need. You're all I need. You are my life. You are my breath. You are my everything. I bless your name. And God showed up. Father God, we bless you this morning. We thank you. went on divine says it is the life of God in the soul of man Lord Jesus we bless you we thank you how you cover over us in your love you watch over us you take care of us when we go through our darkest valleys and our deepest longings and our greatest fears you're so close you're so close you're quiet but you're close there is no God like you and we pray dear God this morning that our hearts will always look fresh at the cross every day and know there that that dear dying lamb was dying there for me and he did he is the bread of life for my hungry soul. He is the spirit that leads me beside the still waters. He is the almighty, the shepherd that leads me in the pathway of righteousness every day. He prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He anoints my head with oil. His goodness and his mercy is always, always, always over me, leading me. Through all the valleys of life, in the highs and in the lows, and then when the journey's done, that I've served the Lord with all my heart, serving Him, knowing His mercies, His mercies, His mercies, His faithfulness. He's there then to take that journey with me. Lead me and protect me through that great valley of the shadow of death where I will fear no evil. We thank thee, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you. Get us, Holy Spirit, get us, break us that we lay down our weapons, our wills unto the Lord and take up yours. I pray for any lost soul in here this morning. Lord, Holy Ghost, save and save to the utmost. We thank you. We worship you. May the glory of the Lord's face be upon us. In Christ's name.